thanks everybody for joining us for this webinar. You know, this a, a lot of webinars we do are kind of fun, kind of lighthearted, a lot of good information, good news to pass along. This one, uh, you know, we're going to have good information, but unfortunately, this is in response to some some pretty tough situations, some pretty tough conditions that are out there across the country. And it's not just localized in one area, and it's not all just because of the same reason. And so we just were hearing enough people having issues with failed cereal crops, primarily wheat, but we've seen a lot of this uh, with triticaline. There's even been some rye fields uh, that didn't survive. We wanted to put this together. So uh, I'll just introduce myself and then my, my friends here who are on and then just kind of set the stage and then we'll get started. My name is Keith Burns. Uh, I am the co-owner and co-operator of Green Cover Seed. Uh, and with me today, uh, we have our contract production manager, Scott Ravencamp. Uh, many of you know Scott. Scott has uh, great experience in being a farmer uh, in eastern Colorado. So you think you farm in a tough area? Scott knows all about that because he farmed for many years in dry land, eastern Colorado. So he's no stranger to failed crops, no stranger to drought, no stranger to winter kill and things like that. He has since moved to Nebraska and is working for us managing all of our growers. So Scott has the unique position of seeing and talking to growers across the wide geographic area. So he's in Northeast Nebraska. So we've got growers there and in South Dakota, but a lot out in Western Nebraska, Eastern Colorado, Western Oklahoma. And he's in touch with those guys every day. And so he's going to be able to bring some really good perspective of not only what's going on out there, but, but some thought processes to go through. And then, of course, I think everybody knows Jimmy Emmons. Jimmy is our good friend from Leedy, Oklahoma, from Western Oklahoma out there. Uh, Jimmy's a farmer and rancher. And so he has, uh, you know, he's a veteran of many droughts, a veteran of many difficult situations of, of fires and, and all manner of things, but he also has perspective way beyond Western Oklahoma uh, because he has had extensive experience working with farmers all over across the country, uh, served uh, under the Trump administration uh, with USDA as a farmer advocate. Uh, so he is no stranger to working with farmers and helping them think through issues and problems that they're facing. So I think we've got the right people on here that have a great width and breadth of experience to bring to the table. And before we get started, I just I just want to tell you a little bit about, you know, what this webinar is and what it isn't. Uh, number one, it isn't the place where you're going to get the answers that you need to solve your exact problem. Because frankly, only you can make those decisions. We're not here to make those decisions for you, uh, but we are here to help you maybe think through what the process is, uh, both from the experience of Jimmy and Scott, as well as what they're hearing from other people in similar situations. So we're gonna be talking about, uh, you know, we'll talk briefly about the conditions that we're seeing out there uh, and then we'll try to spend as much time as possible talking about possible solutions, but there's not going to be any cookie cutter answer here. And it's not going to be the same answer for everybody because, you know, we're dealing with, you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of different situations that each one is going to require a little bit of a customized solution. So uh, if you came in here expecting to get a cookie cutter answer, I'm sorry, uh, those don't exist. Uh, but if you came here to get some advice and lean on experience and wisdom from some people that have been through some wars, uh, I, I think that I will be able to deliver that for you. So, Jimmy, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell us just briefly, you know, in, in both from your farm there in Leedy, as well as other producers that you're working with, uh, what are you seeing out there uh, as far as field conditions and, uh, you know, where's the crop at? Well, I'm, I'm going to use the word brutal uh, because we're in a, a, a D4 drought where we're at. A lot of deep seas and springs all around us. Uh, most of Texas is in that. Uh, Oklahoma, if you drew the line from northeast Oklahoma uh, down uh, Oklahoma City and then south uh, into the Red River, from there west to north. Uh, is extremely dry, and the further you go, the, the worse it gets. Um, so what we're 
in our wheat crop is is failed. Uh, we had crop insurance uh, it's been released. Uh, where we had good cover, um, we're grazing that kind of lightly right now with some cows. Uh, we will be careful to not to disturb the the cover much. Uh, a lot of producers have, have blowing situations now that were uh, not no deal. Uh, and I don't expect that to get any better. If we're under a big fire alert today, 50 mile an hour winds and humidity in the three to five percent range. Uh, and so, from for me, west, east, and north up into Kansas, it's just mm -hmm. brutal. Uh, it, most everybody has failed. Uh, my rye, my barley, my wheat all uh, is either dying or it died already in, in, in tighter spots. So, uh, you know, it, for me, and very around me, uh, everybody's saying it's worse than 11 and 12, 2011 and 12. And I agree, uh, we're in a different cycle in a different time of year uh, when this hit. And so, you know, we uh, was a hard to get up. We struggled all winter and then we just, we just exhausted every ounce of water we had. So. Uh, tough conditions uh, right now, uh, but so far the, the good uh, people that had been no-tilling and had cover uh, were still all right. Uh, I'm worried about uh, the wheat here in the future as it dies in this, this early age uh, that that residue is not going to stay long uh, after it dies. Uh, I've seen some people terminating, and, and I wouldn't do that at all uh, right now. I yeah. don't just leave them alone. So that's kind of where we're at uh, here in, in Texas and uh, Southwest Kansas. Too. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. We've been been hearing lots of similar things, and and great point on you know being careful about going out and disturbing that right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as we kind of think through, you know, what what considerations for the future do you need to be looking at. Scott, why don't you tell us what you're seeing because you're working with people a little further north. And even with some situations where the cereal crop has died, but not necessarily due to drought. So they may have some moisture to work with. So that's going to be a completely different uh, thought process. Yeah. Um, so I have family situations I've covered basically from East Central Colorado to Northeast Nebraska a bunch this winter from the time it was under snow to, to today. Yeah, we're facing some different situations in that area. There's seems to be quite a bit of the cereals. I'm, I'm just going to call it winter kill, I think, for the lack of a better term. Some of it might have been drought, but we're even talking about irrigated production that, that's dead and not just in spots, but 95 percent dead. Um, pretty sure some planting dates played a lot into that, which goes into what I want to touch on this later. But, you know, your decisions now affect what's going to happen this fall. And this is an example of that being able to get in a bit earlier to plant cereals is, is another way to get them to overwinter better, just to get some growth on them instead of trying to plant them in the first part of November. It, it, the, that line I've been driving a lot this winter is what I would call the snow line. I think it was kind of the snow line this winter. It, you know, it didn't really get down into Kansas too much. It is shocking how fast that moisture has disappeared though. Um, even into South Dakota, I'm starting to hear that where they had a lot of snow. The we're, we're going to be back in a drought situation very fast, even in the areas that got moisture this winter, which I think needs to be a factor in your decisions on what you do now. It would it, if it does not start raining soon, we're going to be in a pretty severe drought pretty quickly. And to hold off, to think you're just going to hold off and plant wheat this fall goes back to the word Jimmy's used several times already cover. I think we're going to, we're going to hear the word out of Jimmy and I a bunch today. The word cover is, is kind of the key component to all decisions you got to make to get out of this situation. Like Jimmy said, even with limited water, if he had some cover, he got something to grow. That that's the linchpin to getting out of this is to get that ground covered back up. Yeah. So Appreciate that. And and Scott, I know you and I have had this conversation. It's really frustrating on the winter kill issue because, you know, we've seen winter kill in a multiple different places and for kind of different reasons. Some some areas where 
you know, it was worse uh, with early planning and some with late planning and deep planning and shallow planning. So there's just a variety of reasons. And I don't think we want to get in and try to diagnose those right now. The fact is, if your crop is dead, it's dead. And, and let's talk about what, what to do next. What are the considerations that come with next? So, Jimmy, I want to go back to you here. And uh, a few people said that they're having troubles hearing you very well. So I don't know if you can pull your phone just a little bit closer or um, speak up just a little bit more of that big old deep baritone voice there. But build on the what you started talking about there a little bit about being careful to disturb what you have, being careful to, you know, interrupt that because probably the conventional till guys, it's already been blowing. You're saying the no-till regenerative type stuff is holding okay, even though it's dead right now. What what are you doing on your ground in in preparation for waiting for some moisture to do the next thing? Well, uh, let me back up just a smidge here. We, we had got a little bit of moisture uh, early in the spring. I thought I had some moisture left in the profile at, at that time and planted some spring oats, uh, trying to get some cover uh, on uh, some milo stalks and ground and you know, planted some in some residue. I, I got most of that up except in the milo stalks. I probably got a half a stand because we just ran out of moisture in time that had severe winds and uh, uh, the heat hit us early. Uh, and so now as we look at the wheat, our, our strategy is gonna be, we're gonna have to have significant uh, rain, at least a, maybe a two inch rain uh, to get enough water in the profile before we wanna to try to start planting. Uh, because we're afraid if we uh, disturb the residue uh, and if we don't get a stand immediately, uh, we're going to lose that to wind and blowing because it's a severe heat. We've been in the 90s today. We're experiencing 50 mile an hour wind, uh, 3% humidity. So even if you've got a rain, uh, a lot of that's going to evaporate rapidly uh, with the weather and the wind that we have. So. We're uh, going to try to be ready uh, for a drill and equipment to go, uh, you know, when we can, as soon as we can. Uh, but it, even a no-till drill, when you go through that residue, you, you slice some, some of that up, your your tractor tires, your drill tires, or that, that residue is so brittle uh, that you risk turning that loose unless you can get something green and growing back pretty quickly. So uh, we're going to be on hold until uh, we get some rain. And, uh, that, and, and another factor that we're afraid of is this wheat that's dying early and premature. So it, it, you know there is a little dab of heads here and there, uh, but that lignum's not very high. It's stressed. We're afraid that residue from the wheat uh, is going to go quickly as well because then leaves and everything are going to leave uh, quickly. I've seen some people uh, spraying and terminating, um, and, and I just don't advise that at all uh, right now. Leave everything you can uh, because we're we're clearly not out of this drought. The climatologists that I've been talking to and dealing with are saying maybe late fall before you know this neutral from the. Uh, La Nina to El Nina gets in, uh, and then maybe late fall uh, will be in a wetter pattern. But you know that's just a forecast. It's yeah. that doesn't mean anything sometimes. Yeah. So basically, and it's not an easy thing to do, but just you're just gonna you're gonna just sit tight and wait. If you get a decent amount of moisture, then you'll consider doing a warm season. You know, some sorghum sorghum based mix millet something like that this summer to try to, you know, get some cover. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to have to kind of wait it out. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, and, and I'm going to lean uh, more on the millets with, with some sorghum in there because the millets are <clears throat> can stand a drought a little better than some of the sorghums. Uh, so we <laughs> until we get in a wetter pattern, uh, we're in drought mode, and so we're going to be very – cautious of what we plant and water use deficiency of that plant. 
uh, too. And I think that's something you got to consider. Yeah. Scott, what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, some of the fields that you're seeing there? How about some of these guys that maybe lost their crop, have a little bit of moisture to maybe get something going, but don't have a lot. What, what are you kind of thinking there? Well, and, and I've told some of them, you know, and talked to, talked to some of them, the guys that got moisture have different options. They can, you know, look at cash crops, but again, most, a lot of it was into soybeans or, or uh, peas, low residue crops, definitely discouraging them from going back to another low residue crop. Cause some of that is what's led to our current situation is the lack of residue led to a lack of snow capture is what it looks like to me, which possibly led to some winter kill just from a lack of snow cover on it. Whereas if you could get some residue built back up on that, especially some standing residue, that would help if they're wanting to go back and keep a cereal in their, in their rotations. Um, you know, the other thing is, is the forage situation everywhere. I think pretty much over the entire high plains, Midwest, deep South, I think the forage situation is, is really tough right now. And You've got options. If you've got moisture, you got ways to chase multiple forage crops. Um, you know, we're kind of getting out of the cool season planting window and heading into the warm season planting window, but still they, they have that option if they're going to take it for a forage crop. And, but you got to be really careful doing that. What Jimmy's talking about, you terminate even those warm season crops before they've lignified you're going to go backwards on your, your residue situation or your ground cover situation very fast. Um, and, and the guys that are in long-term no-till or regenerative ag or any of that, I'm convinced that once it gets bare, it blows worse than conventional till. And that's because that organic matter is the first thing to leave. When, when that stuff gets bare, it's going to be the first thing either in the air or in the stream and ground cover becomes even more critical the healthier you get your soil and it you, every decision has to be geared towards that i think and yeah what jimmy said about terminating wheat or the cereals if you've got a decent stand you it, you terminate that now by this fall that's going to be gone yeah. there will be nothing there you've got Scott, maybe, maybe talk a little bit more, you know, you kind of brought it up, uh, you know, forage prices are going to be, oh, they're already high, uh, forage supplies are already low from last year. Uh, what do you hear people talking about, you know, with, with the high price of planting corn, you know, high input prices, do you see, do you hear some guys out there in the country talking about maybe taking some of their marginal land and not planting corn? Uh, but, but, you know, trying to do a forage crop if they've got some moisture to work with. Absolutely. I mean, I think I've even seen it just traveling the last couple of years. I've been kind of surprised at the number of acres that were either coming out of summer fallow or some sort of spring crop and going to triticales, which this year didn't pan out real well because some of those died, but going to a triticale crop that was being taken for forage instead of your traditional grain crops. Um, you move into the lower irrigation areas, lots of interest in using those lower, lower producing wells to grow a forage crop. Sometimes they can even sneak two in there, but it, you've got so many more options to, to water it, to plant it, to harvest it than you do with your traditional corn crop. And if you pull it out, out of corn and just do a cool season crop of some sort, you're not trying to water that through the heat of the summer which is, has been a big issue the last, especially last year. I think everybody would agree with that. Um, you also, when you're going back to the ground cover thing, if you, when Jimmy talked about the millets. One of the reasons millets work so good is they're such a short season crop. You go, you can be almost 90 days on prozo millet from dropping it in the ground to having a mature plant, which that mature plant then is creating that durable residue. Um, sometimes your oats could even fall into that category. That's, that's an important thing to consider. You're not having to go 120 or days or, or possibly six months to go from a planted crop to mature durable residue that will help, will help create that ground cover that you need to get out of this. You know, th those are all the factors you got to look at is what, what are you going to want to do to create that durable residue and, and forage is going to be critical, but you got to be really careful grazing immature 
plants because when you're done, there's not going to be very much residue left there. You need to have that plan either to let it regrow or to get a next the next crop put in there that'll get that ground covered back up. Yeah. Now, when you were farming in eastern Colorado, you guys that was kind of the heart of millet country there. Talk, can you talk just a little bit about you know when and where you would choose proso millet versus maybe a foxtail hay millet? Uh, you know what what are, what's your decision making process there? You know, I, I wish I could tell you that everybody can grow prozo millet because it is pretty easy to grow. It doesn't take a lot of water. Super good at getting the ground covered up and creating a good durable residue if, if it makes maturity. Um, the trick is it takes some specialized equipment um, and it takes a special environment to, to harvest it. You don't want to be in a situation where you're getting a lot of rain in the fall to, while to, you're trying to, to, harvest harvest, that. to harvest it for grain. To harvest it for grain and that that's the big difference is is it is the harvesting of the prozo millet versus your hay millets your hay millets are just you can treat them like any hay whether it's grass or sorghum or even alfalfa i mean you just need that window to to get it put up you know prozo millet if you don't get it in a windrow at the right time or get it direct cut it, it's going to start shattering out or just fall flat on the ground and and you've lost it it you know, just having the access to that equipment. I, I discourage people from doing it. I get asked that question a lot. I just got asked that by a neighbor here in Northeast Nebraska, why he couldn't grow German millet for seed production. And I said, well, I'm sure you can grow it. You've got to be prepared to get it harvested because it's a, it's a whole different ball game. And that's really the big difference between the two. Um, they're both Excellent. Like Jimmy said, there probably is no better warm season crop for getting the ground cover up. Some of it's simply the number of seeds you're going to drop. Oh. I mean, it, you're, you drop 10 pounds out there and you've done a bunch of ground cover and, and they're fast on getting out of the ground. Even when they're small, if they die when they're six inches tall from drought, they create a pretty good residue. Probably one of the better immature plants that'll create residue for you. And, and set you up to go back to, to a fall seeded crop. And, and it's gonna be one of the lowest cost things you can plan out there just, just to get ground cover. So, so what I hear you saying is it's a good option for quick, cheap ground cover. If you were to be blessed with enough rain and it grew out to you know, uh, more maturity and you do wanna harvest it for seed or grain, uh, you may need to look at some specialized equipment um, or of course, you know, the, the hay millets you can hay, but, but again, remember if you do that and it turns dry again, it, you know, now you've lost that residue that you worked so hard to build up. Jimmy, let's see if your mic works any better now. Can you hear me now? Well, can I can hear, hear you now? before, but we'll, we'll see what people, we'll see what my people tell me here. If, uh, it's if much better on my end too. Oh yeah. They say way better. So. Okay, well, good. I've got off the Bluetooth out of the vehicle here and went directly to the phone. So okay. maybe that'll cure that. Okay. So yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy, and um, tell you know we we've been Scott and I've been just talking about you know millet and the option there. You mentioned millet earlier is probably something you you would go to if you got some summer moisture. We talked about we don't want to disturb that. Uh, you know, if it's not blowing now, just stay out of it. Wait, wait for uh, some moisture to come. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you've used millet in the past as kind of a rescue crop. Yeah, like I said earlier, and I agree with Scott 100%. Uh, you know, they're so durable uh, and it is seed size. You can throw a little bit out there. Uh, I like multiple species of millet, just kind of gives me that diversity in different heights and, and different quickness, uh, but they're all really pretty quick how they get established. Uh, and I'll still put a little dab of sorghum and different things uh, in there uh, as well, but not, not a lot, because I really want to be water efficient uh, on that. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking uh, right now. And uh, you know, if, if I was had clean tilled and was, uh, had some blowing issues and, and even some of the no-till guys are talking some blowing issues uh, in the lighter spots. Uh, when we get that rain, I would get on that just immediately 
uh, even if it's a little wet so that you uh, you have that, it's, it won't be so fine uh, on top uh, is what I'm thinking to do. Uh, especially my friends that, that are blowing. I've got a friend that's got 700 acres that's uh, buried the fences in the, into the road a couple of times on several quarters of, of real sandy ground. Uh, and, and that's my advice to him is get in that as quick as you can, get them drill furrows uh, up pretty pretty tall if you can, uh, and then try to get something established uh, with that drill as quickly as you can. Yeah, so you're saying if it's already blowing, you probably won't hurt yourself by running the drill through it. Yeah, and, and once again, they're going to have to have significant rain uh, to do that. And part of the issue uh, down here in sandy loam ground, uh, you, the clay is what's going to blow away first. It's lighter than the sand. Uh, you know, everybody thinks that sand is leaving. Well, it's the heaviest. It, it's still going to leave, but you're going to lose the clay uh, first, the clay particles, because they're lighter. Uh, and so your soil is going to change a little bit. Uh, in the next crop getting up and around it's it's going to be uh more sand for sure uh and so i would get in there just as quick as i could behind the rain if you get a significant rain and, and just try to get something up yeah and, and so i i guess that kind of begs a bit of a question you know from a timing standpoint you know and again, I don't, this, this is not a sales seminar, so I'm not wanting to tell people that they need to get seed ordered, but Jimmy, what, what's your, and Scott, you can address this too, you know, back when you were farming as well as how you kind of advise people now, you know, what's your thoughts on, you know, do you need to have seed ready to go so that if you do get that opportunity, you can, you can go do it, or do you need to wait to have that because you don't know if you need a warm season thing now or, you're going to have to wait till fall and you need more cool season stuff. What's, what's, uh, what's your strategy on that? Well, you know, that, that's the conundrum that we all face. Uh, most of us are on spending whole, uh, trying not to exhaust any more money than, than we can. Uh, but yet you do have to be prepared, uh, somewhat. And, uh, I know you guys in the seed business will do everything you can. But, you know, it's logistically now trucking is not what it used to be. Uh, and so the worst thing can happen is uh, you're prepared, but you don't have the seed. And then it's a week, 10 days, two weeks uh, away from getting seed. Uh, then you're in that 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 situation again. Is it dry, too dry on top? Because I'm telling you, as we move into summer uh, and we're in summer already, we went from winter to summer here. Uh, that that moisture is going to evaporate very quickly, especially with the winds that we've been getting. Uh, you know, I keep thinking we're going to get through this windy season, but where we're at uh, with the climate right now and the way this neutral pattern is, uh, as fronts come through, we're going to have extreme winds. Uh, so I'm, I'm very worried about that, Keith, not being totally prepared. Uh, you know, and, and we may have to even if you can get it mixed, we may have to come and, and see you and pick it up directly uh, rather than waiting on trucks. Uh, because I can't stress enough how important it is to get this covered because the climatologists may, are telling me that our best shot here is in May and the early part of June to get some showers uh, and then nothing until late fall. Now, once again, I'm, I don't want to be a doomsday guy here. I'm just telling you what the forecast is kind of like down here for us. And uh, so we want to get something up. Uh, I've had uh, warm seasons just get boot high to knee high and, and then drought hit them and they'll shut down. But at least you will have it covered and you won't lose your soil. And even if they die, then for lack of rain, we're going, if we're going to go into the fall, late fall, we may not get a cereal planted uh, in time. So we want that residue there. And I know what's going to happen. A lot of producers are talking about haying and grazing already if they can get something because all the hay uh, has been exhausted here. 
if you do that, be sure to cut high enough uh, to leave that residue for wind protection on that surface. Do not scalp it off uh, if you're able to make any. Uh, I, I just, just can't stress that enough because we're not out of this yet and uh, it may get worse before it gets better. Scott, what are your thoughts on around that topic? Man, I, I couldn't agree with Jimmy more on, you know, I want to tell people to get seed and have it ready. And, and probably the guys that got irrigation or have a better moisture situation, I would say, yes, go ahead and get your seed. And part of that reasoning is if it rains in Oklahoma and Southwest Kansas and Eastern Colorado and a big portion of Nebraska, logistics seed supply are going to be even worse literally overnight. Mm -hmm. And so if you think you're going to want to be doing some of this stuff, I would encourage you and you have moisture, have the ability to have moisture, get your seed on hand. If you're in Jimmy's situation, Jimmy and I both know the seed you want to plant when it rains can be a big difference between now and possibly October, which might be the next time it rains. So you don't want to have that seed, but like Jimmy said, you have to have a plan on what you're going to do at that particular moment. And yes, Jimmy said it perfect. Logistics are a big issue right now. You do not want to, you know, I'd love to, Keith's probably going to scold me afterwards, but you don't want to call green cover on Friday morning and expect to have seed Friday night to plant Saturday. <laughs> you know, that just, it, unfortunately, just isn't going to happen. Don't count on that happening. And, and like Jimmy said, you might have to get in your pickup, your truck and come in and get it, especially as Jimmy said, as we get into the summer and, you know, this pattern has been rough. But the fact is, when it does rain, it rains a bunch and it only rains for a short amount of time. You have to be ready to move. And in the summer, that that moisture is going to disappear fast, especially if your fields are bare. I mean, you're literally going to have possibly hours. It may not even be measured in days. It might be measured in less than 100 hours to have that seed in the ground. And that means getting the seed, but you have to have that plan, be in contact with the team at Green Cover or whoever you use to know where the seed's at, know what the seed supply is, just so you know what your situations are. And, you know, it, it's going to be a tough situation when it happens, but you've got to be ready to, to, to pull the trigger and do something to get it covered back up. Yeah, and Keith, I want to touch on something that Scott just said. Uh, my good friend that's uh, got 700 acres of, of blowing uh, severely, uh, he was 20, well, about 48 hours behind his neighbors planting. He, he chose to plant uh, around his house and other areas up there, and everybody else got their wheat up, and he did not. And, and uh, you know, the same, I mean, same quarter across the road, and all around him so it, it's literally ours uh when when we're on limited moisture uh and don't be thinking days you know thinking hours and uh you know i i know i would like to think that keith can deliver overnight uh, within a day or two but i really know that they're not going to be able to and, and even mixing may be a problem if you know a huge demand comes in uh that quickly uh so you know be prepared to get in the pickup and go and be patient with your seed dealers, whoever they are, uh, they're going to do all they can. They want it out the door, but they can only do so much too. So our strategy is going to be, we're going to get a little bit of stuff here for warm season, not a lot, but enough to, to get us started uh, on our worst fields. Uh, and then uh, if we got to come and get seed or do a different plan, different, like Scott said, then time. Uh, of the season, what you want to plant. Uh, literally, you're going to have to look at the window that you've got till frost and see what will fit that window. You know, if it's July or August here, uh, you know, you're not going to have, but till Halloween in my area, uh, then it's going to be toasted out, give or take, you know, literally two or three weeks there. So just, just be prepared, have a plan. Yeah, good, good, good advice. For, for any situation, but but in this one in particular. Um, we got a couple questions that we'll get to in just a second here, but Scott, you and I talked a little bit uh, too about, uh, you know, the timing of everything and how important it is and how some of the situation that different people are in, and, and this may apply more to some of the winter kill. It, it was more of a timing issue of when things got planted last fall 
more so than the fact that it was just, you know, a really cold, hard, open winter. Now, with drought, you know, you, you, you don't have much effect over that, but, but you can do things to change the timing of when you're planting, and particularly a grain crop. Why don't you talk a little bit about that, what you've seen uh, on uh, some of our triticale production fields and, and what guys should be thinking about now to set themselves up for future success. So, so what I've told some of the producers I've looked at fields on is, yeah, it's a tough situation. You know, it, it sucks. You've lost this entire field. But in my opinion, you learn the most in tough situations and take this opportunity to learn something. Like Jimmy was talking about noticing the crops are you know, alive anyway in ground cover. You learn something when you see that. You got to start asking yourself, how do you get that across the whole field? In this situation that I was looking at was, you know, it probably come down to a week or two's difference in planting dates. Sometimes it was some variety issues. Again, we need to learn from that and, and remember what caused that. And a lot of it is, is our push for higher yields in corn and soybeans, especially are pushing us to longer and longer seasons, which is pushing us to later and later planting dates on these cereals following them, yeah. you know what could have we given up on a yield on some soybeans if we could have pulled the planting date back two, three weeks on these cereals and, and got a crop this year with what it looks like is going to happen to these crops, the market could, could be a little bit different. And that's, again, that learning factor. You, you got to try to learn from that experience. What, what caused some of the failure? You know, yeah, the weather played a big part in it, but the fact that there were alive plants out there tells you that you were literally inches away from making it work. What caused the plants to survive versus the plants that died? Yeah, and, and so that, that just goes to, you know, you almost need to be thinking a year ahead of this is where I want to be. And then you have to back up and say, what decisions do I have to make to get myself to that point? as opposed to getting to the point where you're going to plant it. And it's like, oh, I'm going to be late. You know, maybe I'll take a risk on it. Maybe I won't. Uh, but yeah, too many of us don't think far enough ahead. And then, and then, you know, back, back think about what decisions do I need to make to get myself set up for that success or that point right there. So. I, I, I kind of try to describe it as quit playing tic-tac-toe and start playing chess. And, and that, you know, it's a tough thing to hear sometimes, but that's what it is. A lot of corn and soybean farmers are wanting to get cereals into the rotation, but they say they don't have a window, but it's because of a choice they're making to, yeah. you well, just, or, or they'll say they, you know, wheat can't pay for itself, but they're only growing 40 bushel a week because they're planting yeah. it November 1st. Yeah, and, exactly. And so they're not, they're not giving it a fair opportunity or a fair chance to pull its own weight. Correct. Yeah. One, one more quick conversation before we go to some, some questions here. We, we started this and then we kind of worked on some technical difficulties with the conversation about, you know, should some of the guys that do either do have some moisture or have irrigation, what would be the considerations of taking some ground out of corn and bean production and planting something for forage to, you know, to you know, help fill a market need in that spot or that area? What, what decisions, if, if this is your ground and doing it, what, what factors would you uh, consider if you were going to make that decision? And, and again, I would recommend this on your marginal ground where you're going to have your lowest corn and bean yields anyway. Uh, you know, what, what would be the thought process there? Jimmy, I'll start with you. Well, it, like I said, there, there's no hay supplies here. We've got guys getting hay out of Minnesota uh, right now. And, you know, trucking is a, a big issue uh, there. Uh, so you take me last year, uh, last summer, I was looking at hay supplies around, even my own. Uh, I jumped in in a couple of pivots, uh, planted some uh, sorghum, some brown midribs, uh, then made five to six bales an acre. Uh, they're worth $150 a bale right now. Uh, so, you know, plant what the market's telling you. Uh, and, you know, you got to figure that out yourself. But th there's going to be a big demand for, for hay, feed, uh, for the cattle, even though we've exhausted a lot of animals out of, out of the country here. As we start getting into the rain period, them animals are going to come back 
for people to have cash flow. Uh, so, you know, look at them markets and, 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 and talk to some hay brokers and, and try to set up some uh, uh, deals if you can and, and be prepared. Uh, if you're not in a pivot situation, you know, you're going to have to, once again, uh, look at that window when the rain comes uh, and, and be careful of what you plant uh, and, and look at that frost line and dates uh, to see what you can grow in that window. Don't plant a 100, 120 day crop uh, that you're only going to have 75 or maybe 90 days uh, to maturity. So, you know, just just plan the best you can is is what I can say. But the, the forage uh, is going to be in a huge demand uh, all over Texas, and Oklahoma, southwest Kansas and eastern Colorado, it looks like to me. Scott, I, I would say that that forage demand is going to stretch quite a ways north, Jimmy, probably at least through the state of Nebraska. Um, Boy, I tell you, from what I've seen driving around, you know, we're not even touching on this subject, but what what's happening to our quote unquote native rangelands through this drought. And so I, I'm trying to get people to look at it from a multi-level perspective. You know, if you've got a little bit of moisture and you can grow some forage again, don't take the whole farm out of crop production right off the bat. But, you know, I'm a fan of trying to figure out how to graze it. If you've got decent water and moisture and you can do it with multiple crops or multiple cuttings, you know, you have an opportunity to there to do something from a soil health perspective. You can go from a two or three crop rotation where if you plant a diverse cool season mix, take it for forage, come back with the diverse warm season mix, you've now went from a two or three crop rotation to a possibly 15 or 20 in one year by putting all them species in there. So just from a soil health perspective, what you can do on those fields, you can somehow try to implement grazing on those acres you could take one acre of cropland, and I'm just using this as rough numbers, take one acre of cropland and graze it through the summer somehow, pull cattle off of your native rangelands, you're now affecting 10, 20 acres on your operation or your neighbor's operations. That rangeland is gonna need recovery time in the summer, not in the dormant winter season to recover. And, and there are millions of acres of rangeland are severely overgrazed right now. You know, yes, they're talking this drought's going to break, but if it's in September and October when it breaks, guess what that does for our rangeland? Not a whole lot until next summer. And we're probably looking at massive runoff through the winter because we've overgrazed it again this summer. My experience in Colorado, that was the, the thing we didn't even think about when we started messing with grazing diverse cover crops in the summer, especially was the ability to pull the cattle off of the native rangeland in the summer even if it was only for four or six weeks, what that did to the grass in a short amount of time, in two or three years, the difference that made on our grass. And then stockpile grazing stuff in the winter, again, pulling them off the grass in the winter so we wasn't just trampling it all winter while it was dormant. It was, again, you've got to look at that from a multi-tier aspect of what else can you affect by making this decision on this one acre. Yeah, good point. You know, as a general rule, and this varies a little bit from crop to crop, but as a general rule, it takes about 50% of the water to grow the majority of the vegetation of a plant and the other half of the water to actually fill the grain heads and take it all the way out to maturity. Well, if you've only got half the water, why not grow the forage and, and utilize it either as, you know, standing grazing, stockpile grazing, or, you know, in, in situations you could you know, put up forage. It may be an option. Scott, you mentioned earlier, you know, some of these guys in water limited areas may not have enough water to grow a whole pivot of corn. You might be able to grow half a pivot of corn and half a pivot of a grazing mix. And, and you know, you give the grazing mix a, a drink when you can. And if it doesn't, well, you know, it's probably worth the risk of, of just letting it lay fallow. So um, yeah, lots of good things to consider there. Let's go to a few questions here. Um, let's see, uh, Mike's asking, how do people who raise cattle make money when paying $150 per roll of hay? The answer probably is, is they're not, they're not going to make money doing that. They're just trying to keep the cattle alive. I would assume they're Jimmy and, and that, you know, and that's a whole nother conversation. 
you know, if, if you didn't have a drought plan already in place, you're way behind the game already and trying to make a drought plan now, as far as, you know, do you liquidate, do you send them off somewhere else? You know, what do you do? That's the importance of having a drought plan ahead of time. But Jimmy, what, what are people around there doing? Are they, are they liquidating numbers or are they just paying for the hay? Well, most of the guys, uh, you know, Ginger and I sold 150 cows uh, last uh, August, uh, anticipating uh, this drought getting worse. Now, we bought a few back, uh, about half of them uh, to calve out. We're going to have to turn around and sell them now, but I think I made a little dab of money. Most guys don't want to give up their genetics. It is, you know, you sell down the, the cull cows, the older cows, the, the open cows, the, 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 the hard keepers. Uh, once you get down through all of that scenario, the last thing I want to do is sell every cow on my place and then try to replace them when I've got my cattle uh, acclimated to my area, uh, much like you would have a seed crop. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't want to liquidate all of them. You know, I want to take care of the grass and all. Uh, so some of them guys that are paying that type of money, uh, that's what they're doing and trying to stretch it out a little bit and just don't want to get rid of their genetics. Yeah. And, and again, you know, that's a, like I say, it's a whole nother seminar. I've heard some really good ones on this, but, you know, just having a drought plan in place ahead of time so that when this does happen and it's, it happens, you know, to everybody, you know, from time to time, uh, some, some people more often than others, unfortunately, you, you can start to en enact your plan. Uh, we got a question here from Vanessa. Uh, she says, I'm a landlord. My question is this, our Western Kansas section failed due to drought. And my farmer there says there isn't enough moisture to put any cover crops in the ground. Should we just leave the wheat there for cover or other thoughts? Yeah, I would leave it there uh, until you get moisture uh, to do something different let it grow uh that in that area uh that's a brutal area in a d4 right now uh mm -hmm. i would leave it keith yeah they're essentially they're in the same situation that you are jimmy and and that's what you're doing you're just you're just leaving it uh as long as it's not blowing you know hopefully that wheat will hold on as long as it can uh yeah just just kind of let it roll there i think I would add to that, Keith, they just got to be ready to pull the trigger. And, you know, if it's not worth harvesting, just when it rains, get everything terminated, the weeds, whatever you got out there at that time, get it terminated, preferably by no-till in my, in my mind, because you want to leave that residue and then be ready to get something put back into it at that point. You know, don't, don't think you're going to just leave it and go to Milo next spring. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, we got a question here from Annette. Uh, she says, when you are grazing failed grains, in addition to not taking too much through grazing, too much of the residue, uh, should we be trying to paddock the pasture so animals will trample and lay down the rye criticale stems to cover the ground? You know, so in other words, do you, do you also change your intensity or duration on those acres if you're grazing a failed cereal, assuming that there's enough there to graze? So I'm kind of torn on some of that, Keith. Uh, trampling down, getting that cover on the ground is 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 good. Uh, it helps you keep shaded. It, it helps you hold that moisture in. Uh, but we're also in a windy uh, time period with this changing. Uh, and so, Annette, I, I would probably say a little of both. Uh, make, increase your intensity some, but leave some of that a little of that, maybe 20% standing up because you can't believe how just a little obstruction standing up will help you uh, and to keep your residue from blowing away because if you lay all that down, uh, eventually the, the microbes are going to kick in. They're going to take care of that root mass and it can literally blow away uh, once, once that happens. So, you know, just a little obstruction sticking up will really help. So in other words, possibly as you're laying out your paddocks and stuff, just, just skip 15, 20 feet 
and leave that ungrazed as almost a snow fence or a windbreak type fence situation. Yep. Yeah, that's good advice. Scott, have you seen people doing anything similar to that or what's your I thought? I've never seen anybody leave strips. I've planted strips in the middle of the summer of sorghums in large fields to try to create snow, snow catches on bare ground. You know, I, I agree with Jimmy. It becomes a, a game of, yeah, you want to feed your microbes, but you also don't want them to eat it all. And so you want to do everything you can to keep that residue away, away from the microbes on the soil. They're going to eat the bottom off the way it is. Don't encourage them by putting the whole thing down there. You know, it's part of the reason stripper heads are so popular. It's a part of the reason you see in tougher environments, guys not using knives on their corn heads to keep that residue away from away from the soil. And, and one thing, Keith, uh, when I was talking about leaving 20 percent, lessen your in uh, intensity and just don't trample it all in because leave, leave some of it standing up. Maybe you don't want to leave a strip, but leave 10 or 20 percent of that don't tramp it all flat. Yeah, and you can also change that a little bit by uh, as that, especially the cereals, as they get more mature, they're not going to want to eat those anyway. They're going to strip the leaves off of it. And then if you just move them and don't force them to be eaten on it, it'll leave more and more of it standing. Yeah, especially if it's rye. You know, as rye gets mature, it becomes pretty unpalatable, but it still makes great cover. Yeah. So, Keith, one thing that we haven't talked about, uh, and, and I know that's a big situation, uh, hear a lot of from the cotton guys in the, in the Texas panhandle uh, and down even to Lubbock. Uh, here's their conundrum uh, that they've had ground blowing, they, a lot of bare ground down there, uh, but crop insurance uh, is, is going to force them to plant uh, that crop. Uh, if they want insurance on that. Uh, this is not an easy one uh, because everybody needs a little rep, you know, revenue to survive. But please uh, consider the damage to your soil. Don't make it worse. Uh, you know, some of it's not blowing in that Lubbock area yet, but them guys are really concerned if they go in there and plant uh, that it'll turn loose. Uh, so sometimes uh it's 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 better for the soil and, and your farm to lose a little of that revenue of insurance uh versus it blowing completely away and uh you know i i tried when i was at usda and i've tried ever since then to get an exception to the rules in, in weather like this uh you know not forcing you to to, to plant uh, but anyhow that's something to consider the, the, the prevent plant provision of crop insurance is only for like if you're too wet or something like that, it, there, there's not a provision if you're too dry and you just can't plant. Because essentially that's what you're saying. It's a prevent plant situation because it's not going to work, but that's, that's not allowed under that program. I'm not familiar enough with that. Well, the, the problem uh, prevent plant versus planting it, the revenue is going to be better uh, protection is better if you go ahead and plan it. Plan it. And it, if you have a failure, then you're going to receive more dollars from insurance than if you do a prevent plant. Uh, so a lot of guys choose uh, to plant. And, and you know, we're in a different situation than we've been in since the 50s and the 30s. Uh, you know, so just, just keep that in mind. That's a tough one. Yeah. But, but to be clear, if they didn't plant because it's dry weather, they could collect some on prevent plant in that situation. Some, it, it depends on the, the rules and the company and that's, that's all in flex. I don't want to really get into that. Okay. Key, so, but something to ask your agent about. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good question there. Uh, Dan is asking, you know, we talked about, you know, you may need to have some seed on hand and have it ready. So if the conditions allow, you can get it planted. He's asking, you know, do you have tips or suggestions on storing cover crop seed on the farm? I've got a few thoughts on that, but, you know, Jimmy, what if you bring some seed in now, but aren't able to get it planted, you know, how are you going to store that? Well, you got it. That's, that's some of the, the situations. You don't want it to get too hot. Uh, you know, in the barn, 
or wherever you're storing it either. You don't want to affect the germ on some of that. Uh, so you got to be be careful. And when we're in extreme weather uh, and extreme heat, uh, and once again, now the, the Oklahoma climatologist is saying we're going to have a warmer than normal summer, hotter. So we got to 113 last year. Uh, and I asked him this personally the other day. I said, well, are you saying we're going well, you know, situations like that, he said, we're going to be above average. There's no doubt that we're going to be above average. So, you know, keep that in consideration when you're, you know, and you're in the seed business. I'm going to let you comment on that more than me, but, you know, you got to watch the heat as well. Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Jimmy. You know, for the next several months, that's going to be the issue for everybody is, you know, yeah, shipping containers are great to keep the mice and everything out of it, but they are not a good place to store seed for very long. You know, it, you you wouldn't want to put your seed in an oven, and that's basically what you're doing. You know, there really isn't any super good options in my mind other than pro boxes. I, I love that because that keeps the mice out of it, and maybe the cats and everything else. But, you know, not everybody has access to that. So there's not any super good options to store seed long term. That's what, another reason you don't want it all on hand, in my mind, if you're not sure you're going to get it planted. I would be hesitant to tell you to get it out there, but I like Jimmy's plan of having some of it. That gives Jimmy two days of running while green cover gets their seed and their act together to get him more seed. Yeah. Two, two things that will, will really hurt seed germination. One is extreme heat, but the other one is moisture and humidity. So if you're, if you're in a dry area, you're not going to be worried about a lot of humidity. So it's really hard to store seed long-term in hot and humid conditions, it's much more feasible in hot and dry. Now, what you have to be careful of is having that heat for such an extended period of time. So if you have a barn that is, is you know, it's ventilated and the air can circulate through it and it does cool down at night, unlike a shipping container that's always enclosed, yeah, that's just a cooker and, and that it will not survive in there. If, if you have it in a barn or a building that, you know, you can leave the doors open and air can circulate through and it's cooling down uh, at, at least the ambient temperatures at night, you know, you'll, you'll probably be okay keeping your seed in there through the summer be, because, again, it's low, low humidity situations and that's going to help seed last. So the problem then is going to become, because it's not enclosed, you are going to have, you know, varmints or rodent issues. And so, you know, one thing we've learned here is that millet is mouse candy. Man, they love millet. They will hammer that. So if you just set a pallet of bags or a tote bag out there, uh, you'll have every mouse in the county there having a party on it. So like Scott said, you know, you're going to need a, a, a pro box or an enclosed box or some, you know, 50-gallon drums that you can fill. Or I, I don't know what it is. You're going to have to figure that out. So it needs to be enclosed, but it also has to be open so it, you know, can cool off at night. So, you know, we do have some pro boxes that we've been selling to people um, to, for, you know, some situations like this. We don't, I don't have a lot, but we have a few. So we can, we can help you talk through uh, options on that uh, if, if you're ready to have that conversation. Um, Jorge is asking, it just and this is kind of a confirmation, he's saying, so would, would millets be your recommendation for just getting a cover crop on failed crop acres in western Kansas? I would like to graze, but the priority is just to get and keep ground cover. And, and, and I think that's what I heard both of you guys say. Number one, it's cheap. Number two, it, it probably is as moisture efficient as anything that there is and probably gets to a higher lignin uh, form quicker than sorghum or anything else. And so, yes, I think the answer to that would be yes, uh, that, that would be, you know, the, the optimal thing to do there. Uh, Mike is asking, Mike, uh, was the one that asked about the, you know, how do you make money at $150 a roll? Hey, he's just saying, so how much per head per day should a beginning rancher plan on spending on raising cow calf pears? I think that's just your own personal budget and uh, and, and your situation. There's guys that's going to spend uh, way more than they should in a situation economically uh, to keep the genetics or keep the, 
the cow herd they they really love uh and, and you know that's the hard part when you start loving something uh and you don't want to get rid of it and this our as cattlemen sometimes we get that way uh but you know you're just going to have to do the budget that works for you and the banker uh, uh i can't i can't speak for that other than that yeah I, I don't have a whole lot to add to that except i think there's a saying about cows and wives and forgiving one and keeping one or something but i don't i can't ever remember it so i don't repeat it because i get it backwards and i'm in trouble but yeah i mean like jimmy said that's that's each 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 person's individual decision you know there, there's so many there's too many variables in that to come up with a solid answer obviously the the correct answer is as little as possible and you you start there yeah and, and a lot of that's going to you know just be how you're set up on your operation it's going to be cheaper to graze them typically than to bring hay in for them but yeah that's that's a whole nother webinar Right there, probably uh, did have somebody asking about teff grass uh, as as planting something like that, either for grain or possibly just for cover. And, you know, teff might actually be a pretty decent option as well. You know, if you're not familiar with teff, it's tiny, tiny little seeds. There's like 1.3 million seeds per pound. So you could go out there and put, you know, four pounds of teff in the ground. And if you got caught a little bit of rain, it will it will start on less rain than anything else. The question is going to be, though, it will get started. But if you don't get something to help it out, it's not going to continue. So TEF would be an option. Uh, it makes great hay. You can harvest it for grain for the flower market. Uh, that's that's not a huge market. So you'd have to really kind of make sure you knew what you were going to do with it. But you could grow, you know, for 10 bucks an acre, you could grow a lot of teff cover if you caught a little bit of rain. So it, it would actually be something similar to millet. You have to really be careful, though, that you don't plant it too deep. I mean, if you get that in the ground more than more than a quarter of an inch, it's and it's going to struggle to get going. So teff would be an option. I don't know. Have either one of you had, you know, done teff? Yeah, I've done teff, but you just you just laid out the scenario uh here if you got pretty bare ground and, and evaporation rates and only a quarter inch deep uh you know that moisture is going to go away quickly uh and that's the reason i said a while ago if i was planting millets i would put some sorghum in that uh as well so i could plant a little deeper uh with the millet seed even uh and use that that partner that companion to help you get up and out and and that would be my concern on the TEF is you know how do you get it up and how does it survive uh in this arid uh heat stressed area right now it'd be it'd be great if you could get it up and get it to grow uh it's a good hay product and, and can stand a, a lot of heat and a, a lot of lack of rain but that would be my concern getting it up I always remember uh, when Dwayne Back and Dan Forgey and those guys up in South Dakota were playing around with Taff and growing Taff. You know, Beck, Beck had the concept, he called it planting shallow at depth. And so what he would do is he'd take his John Deere drill or whatever drill he had, and he'd set it for like three quarters of an inch deep, which would be way too deep for Taff. But then he'd take a bungee strap and he'd tie the closing wheel up so the closing wheel couldn't run. So he's getting that seed down there at three quarters or even an inch deep where there was some moisture, but because he was not closing the trench, it was essentially like it was planted an eighth of an inch deep. That will work pretty good. The thing that would, would really wreck the heck out of that is if you get a big heavy rain and it collapses that trench in on top of that taff, it's probably not gonna come up. But that might be a risk that's, you know, if you got some moisture there at an inch, you can plant your taff an inch deep, you don't close the trench, and then let that taff come up, you know, from just a very shallow covering, because there's a little moisture, and it's protected from the wind down there then too. And so that that can be, that can be a, a, a way to do it. I know we're going a little bit over time, I just got, we got a couple questions on perennials, and then we're going to wrap it up here, guys. Uh, so one one uh, 
a watcher is asking if you have recommendations on a crested wheat perennial pasture that's losing yield every year, uh, should he plow it uh, under and start over or is there things he could intercede into that? Scott? I'm not a perennial expert other than I believe there's a huge latent seed bank in perennial pastures, especially na anything that's had native in it, that if given the proper management from a grazing perspective will regenerate itself without very much seeding. Now, again, I'll probably get scolded working for a seed company telling you that, but that that's my feeling on perennials is just give them an opportunity and it, you'll be shocked at what can happen. That's tough in the current situation. Um, I, I don't have any personal experience tearing perennials up and trying to reseed them, though. I, I don't know what you do, especially, you know, without knowing your moisture situation and everything. It's hard to tell somebody to tear up a perennial ground cover in a drought. No, I, I would not do that at all. Uh, personally, I would not do that. I wouldn't tear anything up uh, right now. And uh, I'd wait uh, and, and come back with plan B once we get water and then if you want to drill something in that then you have that option but <clears throat> i wouldn't tear anything up right now yeah i would agree and and you know you could probably experiment a little bit on this you know like scott said we we have seen remarkable changes in perennials simply by changing that intensity you know take take an area if you can fence off you know, five acres and you graze all your animals on that really intensely for a couple of days and then move them off and, and you know, don't let them back on there for a whole year. See if that five acres is different than the rest of the field. Uh, you could also take five acres if you wanted to try to intercede something this fall, if you got any moisture to work with, you know, you could intercede some, some clover and some alfalfa and some other cool season grasses. But, but do it on, you know, four or five acres. You don't have to do it on the whole field to see if that's going to take, because it's expensive to reestablish perennials. So uh, do your homework. And part of that homework is doing some experiments like that to see if it's going to work. And, and to kind of close this out here, Matt's asking another perennial question. Uh, he's got a 15-year-old stand. He's in the Flint Hills, uh, Kansas. He's got a 15-year-old stand, a Max Q fescue. That appears to have been killed from dry conditions. He's got a little bit of brome and fescue that have greened up, uh, but this particular field hasn't. He's considering drilling in a warm season annual into it for grazing this summer to create some cover and then go to a cool season perennial mix this fall. He's just asking, is that is that a decent game plan? Uh, you know, we can talk to him later about a specific mix he'd suggest, but. You know, what do you think about that game plan of, of doing some warm season annuals into kind of a, a droughted out uh, perennial mix? I, I like that idea. You know, once you get the rain, get some cover back in that. Uh, if you got the window to do that in, I, I like that idea. Yep, agree. You know, and it and it would give you an option if you can graze that warm season annual to change your grazing on some other pastures because the production could could be fairly significant on those yeah. acres. Yeah, and and Matt, you know, uh, you know, Dale Strickler had done a lot of work with guys in that area on this type of thing, and the things that he has seen a lot of success with, of course, sorghum uh, worked really well. Sun hemp, cowpeas, sunflowers, you know, any of those warm season annuals are are going to do pretty well in that situation. Uh, you'd want to make sure you got your seeding rate proper so that you didn't overload that system uh and again we we could kind of help you do that so um i think that uh, that kind of finishes up most of the questions that we had here uh closing thoughts or comments both scott i was scott first and then jimmy um i guess the only thing i thought i want to add is you know some of the producers i've talked to and worked with corn stock grazing is a huge part of the area we're talking about in, in the winter time, if you can open up the ability to get something in there in the fall next to a pivot of corn stalks that you're going to graze to increase the feed value on those corn stalks. So get in an early planted triticale or a rye or even wheat next to one of your pivots of corn stalks that you're going to graze. I think people would be shocked at, at what they can do by increasing the feed value in the grazing days which will increase our forage availability in these areas 
and help on our on our grass situation. And then also I, I've sent some stuff to Keith and the team this week. You know, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities for interceding into our row crops in these where in the areas we've got more water, obviously with irrigation, but interceding into these row crops to increase in our grazing potential or just our cover crop potential in, in these areas also. Um, you know, it's gonna take things like that to to help get some of our problems fixed especially from the forage perspective. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think we have a bigger issue than simply our crop fields from a forage perspective. We've, we've got a massive problem on the rangeland too in these areas that, that's got to be addressed. And I think you can do it at the same time. Okay, thanks Scott. Jimmy, closing thoughts? You know, uh, th this, this is, you know, probably the most severe drought that I've been in. Uh, you know, my granddad and dad went through other droughts. Uh, this may be the worst, but we know that, you know, this will come to an end. Uh, we just don't know when. But we do know traditionally we'll have severe heavy rains either during this drought or when, when it ends. And now what they call whiplash weather, that may be like a Florida where you get excessive rain. So we just you got to think about this as you plan ahead uh, and, and, and protect that soil the best we can. And, uh, you know, this is one of them situations doing it the way we've always done it uh, is probably not what I would suggest. Uh, this is one of them extreme situations that calls for extreme change uh, to protect that soil. Like my, my good friend and he I classmates at school, uh, really good friend has lost thousands and thousands of tons of soil. Uh, you know, when you have drifts at six foot tall uh, out into the road, uh, you know, that's going to take a long time to, to heal uh, and get back. Uh, just keep that in mind. And, and once again, if he gets a huge rain in that bare situation, he's going to have more water erosion then he had blowing erosion quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in the 30s and the 50s here in Oklahoma. They documented we lost more tons of soil uh, coming out of a drought with heavy rains in that bare situation. So, you know, rangeland, farmland, just the more cover that we can keep on, if you can grow anything, don't take it all back off either in grazing or with the swather. Keep that in mind as you move forward. It will pass. I just don't know when. <laughs> yeah, great points, guys. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Uh, again, I know that we didn't necessarily give people cookie cutter answers, but those just don't exist. And so hopefully some of, of what uh, was discussed here will at least help people's thought processes as you go through the difficult choices ahead if you're in uh, the drought situation or you may be headed into it. Uh, because that area is definitely regrowing again. It seems like that drought monitor had shrunk for a short period of time. Uh, it's it's cer certainly expanding again now. So uh, thank you, everyone. We, are, we will make this recording available on our YouTube channel uh, here in the next couple of days. So if you missed some of it or if you know of other people that should watch it or want to re-listen to it, uh, check out our YouTube channel. It'll be there. Uh, in the meantime, let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you. And uh, Keep praying for rain. So thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot.